Hello, world. We are back on Revolutionary Health Live. I am your host, Michael Ward. I am so very excited that you are joining us tonight. Make sure that you like, subscribe, follow, share this video. Um, we are at CNP Tribe, as is below on the video. Um, tonight, we are going to have a very important conversation about HIV criminalization. Um, we're updating our um, roundtable from last year. So make sure that you check that out as well on CNP TV. I believe the link just came in there. Um, so you can watch 2020's roundtable, but we are back again here for 2021. And I'm so excited to have this conversation. Um, it's very necessary and very needed. And I will be joined by some very, very um, great guests that know so much about this topic. So I am so excited to share this information with you all. Um, again, we are live, so we wanna hear from you, drop questions comments, anything in the chat so we can try to incorporate your thoughts and your questions as much as possible uh, while you're here. So make use of it. Um, so let's bring in the guests that we have for tonight. I will allow you all, hey, there we are. I will allow you all to introduce yourselves, any affiliations that you have and your preferred pronouns. So that way we know how to address you. Who wants to kick it off for us? Do I have to call you by your name? <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I, <laughs> you go, Robert. <laughs> uh, good evening, or good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. My name is Robert Suttle. Um, I am an advocate that's been involved in this issue for about 10 years now. Um, I know so much about it because it is an experience that I've had uh, myself. And so I've pretty much dedicated the past 10 years of my life, yes, 10 years, of really uh, doing advocacy, bringing awareness to this issue. Uh, you can also see me doing work with the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation. I am the current chair of the Council of Justice Leaders for their national HIV is not a crime campaign. Also, if you're connected to the international world, I am a global advisory member, uh, global advisory panel member for the HIV Justice Network, which is people who do a lot of HIV decriminalization work all over the world. And also to many, I am a uh, founding member of the CIRO project for those that are familiar with CIRO's work. So I am glad to be here amongst this uh, group of people because I've been able to work with them in different capacities just over the years. And so I look forward to uh, your questions or any comments that you have in the discussion today. So thank you. And um, hi everyone, I'm Brad Sears. I'm the founding executive director of the Williams Institute, uh, which is a research center on LGBT law and policy issues um, at UCLA School of Law. Um, uh, as we'll talk about in a bit, we've done a lot of research on um, who these laws, who these laws that criminalize people with HIV actually impact. Um, but I really come at this work um, as a person uh, living with HIV who had an AIDS diagnosis uh, in, in the, in the mid nineties, um, and who lived in a state that enacted one of these laws just, uh, just a few years after I became positive. So I too have been working, uh, either under these laws or working against them for quite a while. Hey everybody. Uh, my name is Amir Sadeki. I'm, uh, I use he, him pronouns. I'm the national policy and partner strategist with the center for HIV law and policy or CHLP. Um, we're a national legal and policy strategy center um, and resource for people living with HIV, working to challenge barriers that discriminate against people living with HIV. And um, a lot of that work translates into fighting against these laws that irrationally criminalize people living with HIV. Um, you know, we're one of the founders of the Positive Justice Project, or PJP. Um, it's the first national collaborative of organizations and people living with HIV and legal experts and health professionals working to end the criminalization of people living with HIV in the United States. Um, we've uh, successfully worked with advocates on the state level to change some of these um, discriminatory laws and um, are also right now coordinating a national prosecutors roundtable to educate and bring prosecutors up to speed on, on these statutes. So it's great to be here, everybody. Yes, and I'm so excited to speak with you all tonight as well, I'm here. And I love that people are already dropping um, greetings and everything in the chat, so definitely keep that up. But I want to start with you um, as well, Amir. For people who may not know or are new, or this is their first time hearing about HIV criminalization, can you just give us an overview of exactly what does it mean when we say 
HIV criminalization. Absolutely. Thank you, Michael. Um, for those who don't know, um, HIV criminalization is simply uh, the arrest, prosecution, uh, and imprisonment of people living with HIV for things that are either perfectly legal if you're not living with the virus or are minor offenses that might not be typically enforced. Uh, so um, basically it's applying the criminal law in any way, any criminal law in a way where someone's HIV status or someone's health status as a person living with HIV is a necessary component of the offense. So that can take the form of an HIV specific criminal law that a state, a state might have that criminalizes someone for not disclosing their status prior to maybe sexual contact or another kind of exposure, even if that kind of exposure could not even scientifically result in an HIV transmission. Um, or these uh, HIV crimes can also be sentence enhancements which bump up the penalty level from a misdemeanor to a felony simply just because a person's living with HIV. Uh, a pretty good example of that is um, statutes that criminalize sex work, you know, solicitation uh, laws typically are misdemeanors in states. Uh, but if you're living with HIV, it's automatically a felony. Um, even if you're a sex worker who uh, is virally suppressed and could not even sexually transmit HIV. Even if you're a sex worker who used a condom or another kind of prophylactic device to prevent HIV transmission, uh, or even if you're a sex worker who's who's you know doing things that could not even scientifically or theoretically result in an HIV transmission, simply because you're living with HIV, uh, you're subjected to this kind of severe. Um, uh, uh, discriminatory felony law. Uh, currently, uh, because this year actually we saw so many repeals and reforms to HIV criminal laws, we're still working on analyzing uh, and, and correctly um, and accurately tabulating how many statutes there are now, because there's thankfully been some, some activity in this area this year. But there are about 30 states that have either an HIV specific criminal law or a sentence enhancement that affects people living with HIV. Um, six states, actually, uh, you may have to register as a sex offender after you've been convicted under one of these really awful irrational laws, um, which obviously will have uh, lifelong implications on your access to housing and employment, um, uh, education and services. And really, we're talking about uh, people who have consensual sex, people who are living with HIV having consensual sex, possibly ending up on a sex offender registry. Um, also, there are 25 states from which we know that have criminalized people living with HIV with general crimes, um, the general criminal code, things like uh, reckless endangerment, aggravated assault, assault with a deadly weapon, the deadly weapon being the bodily fluids of people living with HIV, um, or we've even seen prosecutions uh, up to attempted murder in Michigan. We're aware of a prosecution under the state's bioterrorism laws. All this is to say it's, it's not just HIV specific laws. There are also uh, the, the, the issue of, of states that criminalize people living with HIV with these general crimes. And prosecutors have typically described the bodily fluids of people living, living with HIV as deadly weapons even if those bodily fluids could not have even scientifically or theoretically posed a risk of transmission. Yes, definitely. Thank you for that. And as well, there is a link in the chat um, too, where we dropped information on HIV laws that are specific to your state. So definitely uh, make sure you check those out and know um, definitely what the what the law is in your state. Um, because I always tell the story of when I was diagnosed with HIV, I, I didn't know that I was signing a paper basically saying that I understand my HIV diagnosis and it is my responsibility, um, of course, to inform any sexual partners or else I may face HIV criminalization laws. So I think it's very important um, for you all to check that link out um, as well that we've dropped in the chat. So definitely, definitely thank you for that as well. Um, I wanted to move uh, to you, uh, Robert, um, specifically when it comes to HIV criminalization, 
Um, I know LGBT or uh, Black LGBT, uh, the community as well, is affected. Um, and we are on Revolutionary Health, the show that, you know, is for Black gay men's health and wellness. So I just want to ask you, how um, is the Black LGBT community disproportionately affected by these laws? Oh, thank you for the question, Michael. Um, gosh, where do I begin with this? Um, first of all, I would just say, you know, according to the CDC, you know, the MS men who have sex with men or black uh, gay men or bisexual men, um, one in two black or African American men or one in four Latino uh, gay and bisexual men or same gender loving men may be diagnosed with HIV in their lifetime. And I don't know about you, but that's those numbers, those statistics scare me. You know, especially when as understanding how HIV is distributed, these criminalization laws are distributed across the country. And of course, how HIV criminalization looks different in different parts of the country. This, the fact that one in two African-American or black men can be diagnosed with HIV is scary, particularly in the South, um, knowing that the epidemic is so prevalent there. And then also looking at the fact that uh, the imprisonment, the rate of imprisonment, um, I have the numbers here for black men is one in three black men will be uh, face imprisonment in their lifetime and one in six for Latin X men. So when you put those two together, it creates the perfect storm, or as I say, another way for, for black people to be uh, convicted and criminalized. And so um, there's other issues that are at play here. These laws do not look at, look at the fact of how um, black, for black gay men or LGBT people communicate or how we interact with each other, especially when it comes to our sexual uh, relationships. Uh, the laws does not take into consideration um, how we live our lives. And so therefore, as Black gay people, we will find ourselves uh, perpetuating a lot of these laws uh, because we, one, we may feel some kind of way if someone doesn't tell us that or disclose to us about their HIV status. Um, but at the same time, we will also turn around and have that other person arrested and eventually criminalized. And so I say this to say that, you know, the, the law does not do a, a lot to help our our community. In fact, it, it criminalizes and further oppresses us. Um, not a lot. Is, some things are being done to help us pre have HIV prevention, but nothing's being done to improve uh, or to eradicate the criminalization of people living with HIV, especially <clears throat> uh, when we know that uh, that HIV, that people living with HIV are not intentionally, purposely, maliciously going around to infect other people. And so um, there's a lot there to be learned for a person that's living with HIV. Uh, the LGBT community is already surveillance and police enough. I think there's a William Institute um, data uh, report from 2015 that note that LGBT people are still impacted by um, police surveillance and and I also have some other points here that when it comes to um, the health system, there's a distrust there. Uh, there's also legal vulnerabilities based on HIV status. Um, these laws are outdated. And so therefore people are subjected to the draconian laws that, that do not reflect the science today. And so, as I said earlier, they do not, these laws don't take consideration um, how we live our lives. And so it pretty much is cut and dry. If you are a person that, is that is accused of not disclosing their HIV status to someone, and you're in fact living with HIV, it is possible that you could uh, face a uh, conviction. And so um, there's also disenfranchisement. And in the end, there's the collateral consequences uh, that infect people's access to employment, housing, education, and other benefits or opportunities. And I know that we talk about the fact, or has been said that HIV is a death sentence. Well, today it's a prison sentence, but I also want to add to that, that conviction, the conviction, the felony conviction becomes a life sentence. And so um, just something to, to think about there. But with the advancements in treatment and, and science, um, there are ways that now that people can, uh, who are not HIV positive, can um, prevent themselves from becoming positive by interacting with the other alternatives that are available. And so I also wanted to say that it's important that um, Black LGBT individuals continue to have conversations with each other. We need to talk about um, HIV. We need to talk about how that relates to our relationships um, because the law, as I said, it does not take into consideration um, perhaps who's at fault, whether it's both parties, but if that person is living with HIV, that person, the onus of responsibility is on that person. 
Mm. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Definitely appreciate that. And as he said, make sure that you share this <clears throat> video, this conversation. Um, you continue this outside of the round table um, as, we, as we continue this. Um, but let me bring you in as well here, Brad. You look a little lonely, so I want to make sure that we <laughs> include you in the conversation. Um, as he pointed out as well, too, with the Williams Institute, um, that it's done a great deal of evaluation about HIV criminalization um, in states like Florida, uh, where I moved from, into Georgia, and uh, Missouri, among other states. Uh, so can you chat just a little bit about uh, what the findings show for Black people and other people of color? Um, just a little bit. Yeah, definitely. And I and I I think it really so what we do is look at the data from each state about who's actually been arrested and convicted for these crimes. And I think it really when we do that, we see exactly what Robert is talking about is that these laws are written in terms of behaviors um, that Amir described when he described the law describes laws like having sex or spitting or biting that are presumed often inaccurately to be able to transmit um, HIV. But I think what Robert really pointed out is this is not about behaviors. It's not about preventing HIV. This is about systems that were already in place. And this is a tool in those systems um, that have allowed through public health, uh, the epidemic to disproportionately impact um, LGBTQ people and people of color and a criminal justice system that, again, disproportionately impacts LGBTQ people, people of color, and in particular, LGBTQ people of color. And so these laws, uh, that's how they function. And so what we see is uh, in every state we've looked at, whether it's Florida, Georgia, California, Missouri, we just got data from Ohio and Virginia, hundreds and hundreds of people being arrested by these laws. It's not a, it's not a few dozen, it's, it's hundreds. And um, um, for the most part, it's black people and more specific, it's for the most part, it's black people um, and people of color. What the data really shows is black people who are being disproportionately um, impacted by these laws. And um, our data shows that on almost 100% of the cases, there's no proof that, act, that anyone's ever been infected. There's no proof of intent. And in over 90 to 95% of the cases, there's not even conduct alleged that can transmit the virus. So, so when, this, when I'm saying this is not about behavior, this is not about public health, it is not be about behavior or, or public health or preventing HIV. And I want to I wanna drill down on that by going to Missouri. Um, and so in Missouri, where I'm from, um, about five and a half percent of the population is black men. Um, if you go to people living with HIV, 35% are black men. If you go to people who've been arrested for an HIV crime, 50% are black men, another big jump. So you, you, you go to people convicted, you're up to 55%. So if you have, um, if, if you have a country that allows a public health crisis to disproportionately impact, um, black people, if you have a criminal justice system that is designed to disproportionately impact black people and you make a crime out of having that health condition, this is what you see. You see this exactly in Missouri. What does that mean in Missouri? That one out of 43 black men in Missouri with HIV have been arrested for an HIV crime. It's a, it's a, it, it is uh, the state with about the highest level of enforcement in any states. But here's what I mean when this is a system, this is operating in a system that's about incarceration and not about health. Um, the, the area of Missouri that is responsible for most of the convictions under these crimes is St. Louis. So it's, it's not in Kansas City. They're not, they're, there are arrests, but not as much. It's concentrated by, in St. Louis. And if you look at the law enforcement agency, it's the St. Louis Police Department. So if this was about health, you would expect to see it kind of evenly distributed. This is about the St. Louis Police Department. Who are they arresting for these crimes? Well kind of nine out of the last, last 11 people have been, who've been convicted for an HIV crime in the St. Louis area are black men who have one charge at arrest, which is only resisting arrest. There's no sex involved, no needle sharing. They're charged with a resisting arrest, which is uh, kind of a lower level felony. The prosecutors find out that they're HIV positive. They get rid of that charge and switch it to the old 1980s, 1990s laws about HIV transmission because they know now the defendant is HIV positive. The sentence triples, becomes 5, 10, 15 years instead of 2, 4, or 8. Um, and what happens in the criminal justice system? Most people plead. And facing the larger system, they're definitely going to plead uh, with that. And so this is a pattern of the St. Louis Police Department. 
And, um, you know, it's it's a law enforcement officer against the person on the street about what resisting arrest look like. They find out a person's HIV positive and then they can get them to plead to that crime or, or basically anything else because of the sentence. So when we say this isn't about behaviors, it's not about public health, it's about a system. I can't think of a clearer example uh, of that. And, and Amir mentioned we have these prosecutor roundtables that CHLP does. Prosecutors will say this. We like these crimes because they have high sentences. And once we know their HIV person's HIV positive, we can get them to plead to all sorts of things. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. I mean, one in 43. And as you said, once once we know somebody is HIV positive, we can get them to plead to any to any crime. It's Yes, it's it's just unbelievable. Um, when you put it that way with the numbers. Um, so one of the one of the things as well that I'm curious about is there are um, you wonderful folks that are working to change these laws and advocating for people who are, you know, incarcerated. Um, what have we learned um, from states that may have modernized these laws? How do we um, impact change with these laws? And I'll open this up to anyone who wants to take it. Um, but what are some of those ways that, um, as you said, these are draconian laws and older laws, how can we modernize those to take into account now that we do have um, a medicine that allows people like me to live longer um, and prep, you know, and we're having these conversations. I mean, there's more knowledge. What, what can we learn about that? Well, you know, Michael, I think one of the important things that we might want to foreground in this discussion is that from the states that have either repealed or reformed their HIV criminal laws, it's important to remember that what we're learning is you kind of get one shot at this. Because states, for example, like Iowa, that uh, has actually been used as an example, I've heard anecdotally, from state health departments in southern US states who are becoming interested uh, in changing these laws are using the Iowa reform as an example. Uh, we've, we've been able to, to track at least 15 cases since the uh, change in the law in Iowa where HIV criminal charges have been filed and it has resulted in seven convictions. Um, one sentence uh, was as high as 80 years for an individual in 2017, 80-year sentence. Some, some of those years are, you know, are also um, for, for other offenses from this individual, but we also know that someone just last year was sentenced to 26 years because in the Iowa reform, they did change the law to to make the threshold for prosecution a little bit higher by requiring that someone need to act with an intent to transmit HIV, which is an important thing to advocate for. And I can dig into that a little bit more when we talk about you know, the important principles for reform. But in Iowa, they did keep a possible 25 year felony uh, sentence on the books. And you know, I think to, to, to add to what Robert said, a felony conviction becomes a life sentence. It stays with you for life. It affects your eligibility to vote in most states. And actually, I think in Iowa, it's one of the states with the most restrictive uh, uh, disenfranchisement provisions in, in state law. Uh, so you have a state where it's still a, a felony crime to be living with HIV and engage in certain kinds of conduct. Um, and it's translated to a situation where we're continuing to see the enforcement of this law all the way up to last year, at least. Um, so I think it's important to, to, to take note that you, you know, despite maybe what, what some, you know, especially national organizations who have an interest in passing a law and um, cheering about it and then leaving the state and leaving people in that state to be, to, you know, live with the consequences of that change even if it's built on a strategy that has left some people behind or has kept things that are continuing to punish people irrationally. Uh, we, I think it's important to, to, to unpack that you, you get one shot at this and it's important to make sure we do it right. Because unfortunately this year, there has been a lot of exciting momentum in changing these laws because as Brad and, and, and Robert said, this is not about actually deterring risky behavior 
law enforcement has no interest in protecting public health and defending public health, and they actually have no business responding to any pu public health issue because punishment is not a public health strategy. It doesn't work. We actually, there, there's just no evidence to support that these statutes have resulted in a lower number of HIV diagnoses or less risky behavior. So I think it's important to, to, to unpack that some, some of the things that we've learned are we're continuing to see enforcement in some of these states that have not fully adopted some of the principles that I think are really important to be built into a reform. Because we do want, you know, th these crimes are really out of lockstep with the longstanding legal tradition that you only prosecute people for these serious felony crimes if they if, if a prosecutor can prove that someone acted with an intent, with a conscious desire to harm somebody else, and the harm here being uh, the transmission of a manageable chronic disease. But nonetheless, we, we do think it's important to, to make these laws require that prosecutors have to prove an intent to transmit, like some of the changes, for example, in California, where we saw a pretty high threshold for um, for, for prosecution there with the intent provision. We also want to make sure that uh, the conduct that's criminalized actually has a scientific basis in being a, a known route uh, for HIV transmission. And finally, that prosecutors should have to actually prove that, that HIV transmission occurred. Because as, as Brad was saying, with some of the enforcement data that the Williams Institute has gotten their hands on, they've overwhelmingly shown that that's not the case, that actually most of these convictions didn't require proof at all that HIV actually transmitted. Um, I think an important thing also to learn in these, these years since, uh, you know, the 1994 of, of Texas's law, all the way up to, to the new um, bill that was just signed by the governor in Nevada a few months ago, I think it's important to, to you know, learn from the lesson that, that Robert and Brad are, are speaking about. This is about systems, about socially controlling and policing identity uh, and, and, and socially controlling and policing and incarcerating largely, uh, mostly black people and sex workers and people who inject drugs and, and, and the poor. And it's not just about a criminal justice system uh, that confronts people living with HIV as vectors for disease and denies them their humanity and their dignity. It's about the public health and health system too. Um, you know, CDC, without any buy-in or consultation from networks and people living with HIV, announced in 2017 a molecular HIV surveillance program where every state was forced to submit, uh, you know, HIV testing-related data up to CDC so they can map the, the sexual and social networks of people living with HIV to, to guide public health action. But sadly, this data has not been, you know, uh, obtained in a way where the informed consent of people living with HIV has been centered. Um, and we also have a lot of concerns because in some states like Ohio, for example, there are provisions in the law that actually force health department staff to cooperate in criminal prosecutions against people living with HIV. And Missouri was also one of those states that had a provision like that until this, this year's reform act, thankfully scrubbed that provision that, that um, required the health department staff cooperate in criminal prosecutions against people living with HIV. This is not about addressing a public health crisis. This is about confronting human beings and dehumanizing them. And I think, you know, it's important when we look to 2022 and think about the, the many reforms that still need to happen, that we, we fully need to, to change these laws by requiring intent, proof of transmission, and that the conduct actually carried a scientific risk. But we need to maintain communications with law enforcement departments to continue to educate them because it, some, something, you know, the cases we're seeing in, in Iowa are a good example of what happens when we change the law, but do not continue to communicate with law enforcement and prosecutors that HIV is a manageable, treatable condition, that, uh, that you know, it is not a death sentence anymore, and, and you know, we should be uh, protecting the dignity and humanity of people living with HIV if we really cared about public health.
Right. Definitely. Thank you for that. And, um, as well, too, thank you for the comment, Jerrica Hall, that this is an amazing opportunity for me to learn all of this information. So thank you all. Um, yes. Yeah, so just thank you all for, for bringing this information to us.